let's bring you some laws regarding Ghana's elections and what the law says you or people around you or the parties or government for that matter need to know as we go into the, the elections. Today on Election Nuggets, we are focusing on what should be done or should not be done when we go to the polls. We are focusing specifically on just before that. We are just 18 days, 18 days away. You can count it at the fingertips, 18 days away for that crucial election on December 7. So keep that uh, uh, at the back of your mind. Let's look at some specifics of what the law says regarding Ghana's elections. Nothing is done uh, out of the blue. Everything is backed by law. So today, our election nugget says... A person who willfully obstructs or interferes with an election officer in the execution of duty commits an offence and is liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding 500 penalty units. In current terms, that would be like 6,000 Ghana cities or to a term of imprisonment not exceeding two years or both the fine and the imprisonment. And it is from the 1992 PNDC law uh, CL 284, so representation of the people's law, Rupal, as some call it. And that is the law that, that we are getting this specific nugget from for you. And to help us understand what it means in plain language, you don't have to go to the Supreme Court. We've got our own Supreme Court interpreter in the house. <laughs> <laughs> we have Joseph Akable with me, and uh, he's going to be helping me throughout the show. So this is what is said by the law, what does it simply mean to the layman? I mean, there are a lot of activities that takes place uh, during elections that basically interferes with the work of the election officers. And the election officers, for most stations, the head will be the presiding officer, but there will be other officials who are also at the various places that participate in the process. And so what this law seeks to do is that it seeks to afford the election officers the opportunity to carry out their mandates in a free manner. It simply bars persons who show up at the various polling stations from interfering with them. And the point being made is that, look, when you go over there, you may have concerns, you may have disagreements with them, you may have suggestions. Just do it in a manner that does not interfere with their work. What we are seeing from the laws that we've been bringing to our viewers so far is that there are lots of breaches that more often than not, we do not take it up against the various individuals who are corporates because of the tense nature of the elections. Mm. But these laws are supposed to protect the entire exercise to make it free and fair and also make it transparent for everyone. So it's very important that we simply go to the states and not interfere uh, with the process that is taking place there. Mm. So it means that when you go to vote, although there are laws that protect you, there are laws that also protect the election officials. One of which is that be careful not to interfere or prevent them from doing their work. Otherwise, you're likely to go to jail for at least less than, no more than two years, or pay uh, a, a fine of about 6,000 Ghana cities. So now that you know, it's good for you. Keep that in your knee and in your pocket and in your mind as you go to the poll. So today, I also indicated that one of the key conversations we'll be having on the show has to do with female participation in Ghana's elections. There are two genders in Ghana. Forget about the fact that there's an LGBTQ case in court. Hopefully, maybe, while the show travels, if there is any new development regarding that, we are told the Supreme Court is sitting on that case today. If they do start sitting before the show ends, we'll go to the Supreme Court. So you, let's put that aside. There are two known genders in Ghana, male, female. However, over our electoral cycles, the male uh, gender has dominated in almost every sphere of our politics. And there have been a number of campaigns and advocacies to get women participating in Ghana's elections. Many, many such campaigns have been ongoing and currently still is. Even here at Media General, part of our constituency engagements, we even have specific women manifesto conversations. So today we want to look at how the trajectory has been since 92, and even as we get ready for December 7, 2024, what do the numbers look like for female participation? And that's the conversation that we are about having now. So on the screen now, and Akable is still with me, you can tell that right from 92, a few women have dared the odds to participate in elections. And from 92, you can see that the numbers have been um, very low. In fact, our lowest, we can say, was in 92, uh, when 16 women dared the odds, broke into the frontiers of politics, and actually campaigned to get into parliament. So the first parliament in the Fourth Republic, we had 16 women in there and 184 men. Blake. Talk us through what it's looked like and uh, whether we have made progress or the campaigns are actually not achieving the desired results. 
I mean, if you were simply to look at the figures from 16 to 40, I mean, the obvious answer would be that some progress has been made. But the context we have to put it between is that from 16 to 40, within all the entire period, at every turn, our population has always favored women. There are more women in Ghana than there are men. Mm -hmm. And so one would make the argument in simple terms that when you are picking from the basket, whatever reason you are picking from the basket, logically you should expect that you are likely to chance on more women than men. But we see it playing out consistently in all spheres of our governance life. At every turn, you have more men playing those roles than the women. And so the question comes back to the point that, is it the case that women are not getting the needed support they need? It's for that reason that one of the reasons we have the Affirmative Action Bill, which was in Parliament right from the early periods of the 2000s, all throughout recently when it was passed, all to try and deal with this particular problem that we are facing here. And so even from 1992, and the context again is that Parliament started with a level of 200, and we are currently at 275. So even right from that 16, we went to 18, we went to 19. We came to 25 in 2004, which many at the time thought that, look, it's been a significant number that we've arrived at. Unfortunately, the number dropped in the two, uh, 2008 elections down to 20. For 2012, it went up again to 31. Then 16, it went up to 38. And 2020, it hit the number of 40. So what we can see from at least 2008 to 2020 is a steady rise in the numbers. And so if the trend is anything to go by, then one would expect that going into 2024, we can see some improvement. But... There's a bit more on the data set that tells a story that shows that this may not necessarily be the story that we'll be looking at going into the 2024 elections. Mm. And, and again, it's also uh, instructive to note that in some of those election years, like in 2012, for instance, we had more registered women in the country to participate in elections than men. But then again, the number did not reflect. So you would have thought that so far as we had more women registering to participate in elections, naturally, we should be looking in excess of at least 50 for the women that are going into parliament. But the number, it's, it's up until 2020 that we've been able to make even up to 40. And our hope is that based on the efforts that have been put into the campaigns, especially to get women into active politics, they should be able to cross the 40 line. What are the, some of the key barriers from the data, the, the data we've, we've, we've been able to comb through that stifle or hinder women from participating in politics? I mean, what we see is generally even the representation and the decision to contest. And so we are not yeah. seeing a lot of women, of women contesting. And if we can just go a step further, for instance, and look at 2024 elections. So we are going into 2024 elections. There are a total of 801 parliamentary candidates contesting across the country. So we see the male being 683. That is 85.2 percent male, mm. female 118 being 14.7 percent. Mm. Right from the onset, it tells you that no matter how we vote, whether they are going to vote for all the women candidates or not, mm. we are still going to end up with a parliament that will have more men than women. Right. So the right. starting point we see from this data is in simple terms that a lot of women are not showing up to contest. Mm. As to what is mm. causing that, the report that we will later on be looking at, you have some of the women complain about how they are attacked when they want to contest, how even their social structure, yeah. because the women are supposed to take care of their children at home and all those things. Mm. Some of these uh, structures that have stuck with us for a while affects their ability to freely go out to their campaign mm. and want to participate. We've seen women who have tried to replace their husbands who have died and various comments that have been made mm -hmm. against them. And some of these comments, some people say that it makes it very difficult for them to want to stay in. But what the data shows is that the outcome of the elections is going to still favor men because you have more men contesting this year's election than you have women contesting right. this particular year's election. Certainly. And uh, this is actually a jump from the 2020 elections where we had 118 women now. Then it was about 98 or just about 100 women um, filing to actually contest. So it means that the number has still inched up marginally, but certainly there's still more room for improvement. 14% of women deciding to participate and the advocacy and the efforts that have gone in, it still leaves much to be desired, but at least it is progress nonetheless, although yeah. very, very minimal. We can also look at the regions with the most female candidates. And I mean, Greater Accra and Ashanti region are leading a pack. 23 female candidates in the Greater Accra and 21 in the Ashanti region. There are those who will make the argument that, well, look, these are largely cosmopolitan areas. These are areas that are largely to meet a lot more people who have received some level of education, a lot more people who are ready to break the stereotypes, a lot more people who are not going to buy into the narrative that, look, yeah. women must play second fiddle to men. They believe that 
where the men can sit, the women can sit there. They believe that the men can do as much as the women are, the, the, the women are, can mm. do as much as the men are actually doing. Mm. And so these are the two regions that we see in terms of good numbers coming in there. And if we were to see this one reflecting across the 16 regions, it will mean that this figure will perhaps be much better than it. And so that is how it looks in terms yeah. of the numbers here. Then we try to look at regions with the least number of female candidates and Northeast, there's none coming over there. Mm. And so it means that a place like Northeast, you are not going to expect a female at all. MP from that region. At all. The same thing in half where all men contesting mm. in that particular area. Then the Savannah region, there's just a single one taking place there. So this tells you how it will look in terms of the outcome of the elections in these areas as compared to the Ashanti and Greater Accra that are more likely yeah. to have more women coming yeah. from those areas. Right. And then, again, if these numbers are anything to go by, mind you that the Greater Accra region has the most female participants or female contenders in this year's elections. And 23, keep the 23 in mind so that when finally or eventually the elections are done and we do have women in parliament, it probably should be from this number. So we are seeing that if we are able to get all 23 women in parliament from the greater Accra region, that will be uh, quite a good step in the right direction. However, we are uncertain what it is that will happen.